So if you look at these, right, this is a simple ionic compound, okay? And this is the crystal structure. Well, it's not really the crystal structure. It's the representation of it, right? But um, it indicates the crystal structure of something that would be like sodium nitrate or something like that. So it's got a uh, simple uh, ion plus a polyatomic ion. So a monoatomic ion plus a polyatomic ion. And this is, of course, monoatomic and monoatomic. So this would be something like sodium chloride, like what's pictured up there. Um, so I guess today we're really going to be talk about, talking about uh, bonding, covalent bonding, as opposed to ionic bonding. And we'll be drawing arrows, showing electrons moving and whatnot. Okay, just like we did with ionic bonding. So one thing I want you to remember, again, is the charges are oxidation states. I might call them oxidation states and charge are the same thing. Um, but with covalent bonds, right, we're going to be worried mostly about the non-metal. So starting with carbon all the way over. So if we look at the periodic table up here, we can think of anything like there and above and to the right. Okay. So the first thing we're going to need to know about is electronegativity and what does that mean? Well, electronegativity is the measure of the ability of an atom to attract electrons in a chemical bond. So what does that mean? <coughs> it means that when you make a, remember all bonds are made because of electron transfer or electron sharing. Um, what happens is usually unless you have the same type of atom like a bromine and a bromine bonding together. Uh, what will happen is that one of them will have uh, more of a pull on the electron than the other one does within that bond. Okay, So it will be like an unequal sharing. So you can imagine um, uh, two guys uh, playing tug of war. Okay, One guy um, a really big, muscular, huge guy. You know, the other guy's like a little, tiny, skinny, whatever guy. Okay? So the big guy will have more of a pull on the rope than the little guy will, right? That's like electronegativity. Okay? So the big guy would be the more electronegative atom. Ironically, in this case, they're the smaller atom. So the smaller atoms have more of a pull than the bigger atoms. And in fact, what you find is electronegativity uh, increases going like this across the periodic table. This is going to be um, a handout you'll have from now on on every test because it's such an important uh, concept when you're talking about bonding. Okay? So I want you to become familiar with this. Of course, don't put it to memory or anything like that because you'll have it on the test. But you're going to be using this quite frequently um, for the rest of the class, okay? Trying to determine which um, atoms hold uh, more of the electrons closer to them. Okay, so elements with high electronegativity have a greater ability to attract electrons than elements with low electronegativity. Um, so uh, this gives rise to what we call bond polarity. Um, polar things have positive and negative charges, okay? And we'll get more and more into bond polarity in a, in a little bit. Okay, so let's look at covalent bonding. So covalent compounds form from the same. So you got to remember all that electronegativity stuff from now on. Okay, so everything we talk about, you always want to keep in mind electronegativity. Okay. So covalent compounds form from the sharing of electrons between one atom and another. They typically form when two nonmetals react. The bond results from the electrostatic attraction between the nucleus of one atom and the electrons of the other. Uh, and remember, covalent compounds consist of discrete molecules like this. Right? rather than um, massive 3D crystal structures like this. Okay? Everybody can see the difference, hopefully. Um, some common uh, covalent compounds that you might be 
familiar with or will be after this slide uh, are water, H2O, methane, CH4, ammonia, NH3, and carbon dioxide, CO2. Okay, we're going to be learning how to build those molecules and, um, and their bonding. Okay, so let's look at covalent bonding. The simplest uh, molecule that has a covalent bond in it is H2, okay, so hydrogen gas. Hydrogen is a diatomic gas. Um, remember, if we look at uh, hydrogen's valence electron, hydrogen only has one valence electron, okay? Um, but it needs another one to completely fill its orbital. Right? It wants to have two electrons in its orbital. So what it can do, it can either gain one electron and be H minus, right? So let's look at this. So we've got H here. It's got one electron. Remember the first energy level, two electrons fill the shell. And then it's got the noble gas configuration of neon. So we've learned that hydrogen can do one of two things already. It can take this electron and give it up, right? And that would effectively make it not have any electrons, right? So it's kind of a pseudo noble gas configuration. Or it could gain an electron from some other source. And look like that, right? And then it's got the helium. noble gas configurations, if you will. Okay? The top one's a pseudo-noble gas configuration. Um, but what typically happens when you got two hydrogen atoms together, so you got one hydrogen atom here that wants to have an electron, and another hydrogen atom here that wants to have an electron. So what they'll do is instead of one of them giving it up to the other one, what'll happen is they'll share those two electrons in between them, okay? So they each want to have an electron, so if they share it, then they can say, well, we both have two electrons now. And the proper way to describe a covalent bond, so remember with ionic bonds, we described it by, with the electron, you know, just going away or going to another atom. What we would describe with a covalent bond, we want to describe the electron going there, the other electron going like that. Remember the one-sided arrows show the movement of one electron. So when we do that, we get H with one, two electrons like that, and an H like that, right? So if you notice, they're both stuck together. They both have that filled orbital. Um, this is kind of a not the way that chemists usually like to write covalent bonds, okay? They don't like to stick two dots in between them. So what we've done by convention is given a bond a different symbol, and that's just a line in between the two atoms that the bond is made between, okay? So anytime you see one of these lines, you know it's uh, two electrons being shared in between those two atoms. So this is typically what hydrogen does. Okay, it doesn't give one of one of its electrons. So it doesn't do this, in other words. It doesn't go to give its electron to that, go here, go here, and then these two combine to make H2. This does not happen. So you can do the same thing with any two uh, non-metals. Okay, non-metals and non-metals do this when they react with each other. Um, let's try another non-metal, non-metal interaction. Okay, instead of H here, H and H, let's do H and F. Okay, 
so the now you're going to you don't need to necessarily memorize these because you can do these covalent bonds now. You can figure out which ones would be diatomic gases. But it, there's not a very big list here. So what I would recommend doing is just memorizing them. Okay? So the diatomic elements are all the halogens, okay? hydrogen, and oxygen, and nitrogen. Okay? All the group seven, seven A elements, all the halogens. Yeah, all of them. Yeah. But you're never going to see that. So. So it's those up there? Huh? The ones in the top up there? Mm-hmm. Hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. So, not sulfur. No, just the ones that I'm pointing out. And, okay. So that little inverted L and then the hydrogen. that I'm talking about. Just this little inverted L, right, and the hydrogen. Okay. So, um, of course, compounds containing covalent bonds are known as covalent compounds. Okay. Um, so, these diatomic elements, they share their, el their electrons completely, right? So, 50% uh, like if we look at hydrogen, <coughs> we're looking at this gas here, right? Those two atoms share their electrons completely, okay? Why is that? Because they're the same string when they're playing tug of war, okay? They don't have... They both want the electrons more, you know, but they can't pull the rope more, okay? Because they're the same atoms. Remember, the same atoms have all the same properties, okay? So let's look at these guys over here, HF. HF, are those the same atoms there? No. No way, right? So what's going to be happening, right? There's going to be a tug of war here, and somebody's going to win, right? Always. Always when you have different atoms, somebody's going to win. Okay? So what we say is the more electronegative atom pulls the electrons closer to it. Okay? Remember what we said about electronegativity. It increases going this way, right? Increases going up this way and across this way. Okay? So, and fluorine is going to be more electronegative or less electronegative than hydrogen? More. more. Way more. Way, way, way more. In fact, fluorine is the most electronegative atom on the periodic table. That reacts with it. Okay? The noble gases don't react, so we don't include them. Okay? Fluorine's the most electronegative atom. So what do you think when we're looking at this little cord in between them? More of it is going to be on the fluorine here, okay? Remember, these things are sharing electrons though now. So it's not like an ionic bond, Na plus F minus, where the F takes the electrons and becomes a minus charge, okay? So notice there's no minus charge here on the F, okay? Because they're sharing those electrons. Even though the F is stronger than the H, it's still sharing with it. But since electrons are negatively charged and the fluorine has more of the electron density around it, um, it is slightly negatively charged relative to the hydrogen atom, okay? So we're going to use this symbol here, delta, okay, so Greek little d, delta, plus, and delta minus, these symbols here indicate
indicate a partial negative and a partial positive charge. Okay? So if we look here, these guys have um, the same strength, right? So neither one of them can pull the electron more or less. Okay? So there's no partial negative, partial positive here. But if we look over here, since we know the electronegativity trend, we can say the fluorine is going to have more of those electrons around it. So it's going to be delta minus. And H, of course, is going to be delta plus then. Because we've got less of our electronegativity, our electron density around it. So what you would find. talking about this substance, right, I'm not only talking about one molecule of it, okay? When I have it in a bottle, no, I don't have a bottle, say this was HF, it wouldn't, it wouldn't stay in this stuff, but, or in this glass, but, um, say this is HF, right? There's like billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of HF molecules in this thing, right? If, if this was HF. It's water, so we could talk about a different covalent uh, polar covalent compound, but this is the more simple one. So just imagine, so when we're talking about HF, we're not really only concerned with the one molecule of it. We're concerned with a bunch of them, of course, because we don't work with just one molecule. Okay, so if we looked at two HF molecules kind of interacting together, what you would find is that So what you can think of these molecules, I know this is going to sound weird, but you can think of these molecules as little magnets, okay? So remember, like you got a magnet, probably when you were a kid, or maybe still now, uh, you tried to stick magnets together, right? And one side they would stick together, and if you flipped it over, the other side they would kind of repel or kind of float on top of each other, right? This is like these little magnets. They kind of these magnets are not very strong. This is a well, the strongest of the not very strong magnets. Okay, so if we look at like these guys, these are like super duper. These are the ones where you like take the things and like way apart and they'll like smash in the air. You know the magnets that really want to get together, right? So that's like those guys. These guys are like the refrigerator magnets, you know what I'm saying, that are like, they'll fall off if you put a piece of paper underneath them, okay? So that's what you want to think about. This is the strongest one of those refrigerator magnets. Again, I want to emphasize that these non-metal to non-metals, they share their electron so they can attain the noble gas configuration, okay? Like fluorine in this case wants to attain the neon configuration. Okay. So let's think about covalent bonding uh, with molecules with more than one bond. Okay. So let's look at instead of looking at the halogens and hydrogens, let's look, for example, at water. So how do we do that? One, two, three, 
I assume one. Okay? When we look at hydrogen, how many valence electrons does hydrogen atom have? One. One. Okay? So if I get one hydrogen and one oxygen atom together, would that fill the valence shell of hydrogen? Um, yes. yes, it will fill the valence shell of hydrogen. Why? Because hydrogen only wants to have two electrons, right? But will it fill the valence shell of oxygen? No. no. Well, how many more electrons would you need to fill the valence shell of oxygen? One more. One more. Okay. Yeah, so this is why water's uh, molecular formula is H2O. Because it needs that other hydrogen or this other electron to make its bond, right? So let's make the covalent bond now. So if we make that one, right? And then we make this one. And then if it helps you to do this, remember on the test, I, I want to see bonds drawn as lines, okay? But if it helps you to do this intermediate step, please do it, okay? Like that. And then, of course, that's going to go to And remember, you got to show me your long pair of electrons. Yeah, please. So does everybody see that? Those lines are just drawn unevenly because I didn't have enough room. Okay, so don't get too caught up. Well, just don't worry about it. You know, you're gonna if if you think about it that way, you're gonna get all mixed up. Just do it. Just do it this way. Okay, just do it. However, how the, the structure and the Lewis structure are totally different. Okay, the structure is going to look much different. Okay? We're not into structure, so don't try to confuse yourself. Okay? So does everybody understand how water is bonded together? Okay, let's try methane.
Okay, so the bigger of the numbers has the higher electronegativity. Okay, so where is the delta minus going to be on the hydrogen or on the oxygen? Oxygen. Okay, so we're going to put delta minus there. And where is the delta plus going to be? On the H. Okay, so it's going to be on both this H and on this H. So what you can start to think of now, again, like I was saying, is these refrigerator magnets sticking together, sticking together. When you've got a difference in electronegativity, like you do here, so if you wanted to think about it, you could say, um, delta, this delta, this just means change of, okay? Electronegativity, we could say 3.5. The units for electronegativity are called Debye's, okay? It's named after some guy, Debye, who's long since dead, okay? But you can just say D, okay? 3.5 D minus 2.1 D. Okay? So when we do that calculation, we find that we get 1.4 D, okay? 1.4 Debye. So that's the difference in electronegativity between those two atoms. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, it does. <laughs> Subtract one number from yeah. another. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. So this is the difference in electronegativity between these two atoms here. Okay. So when we, so when we say that we've got a difference, what we know about that bond is that it's polar. Okay? Polar just means it's like one of these little magnets. Okay? So, this is going to have a pop delta positive and delta negative charge. So we call this a polar covalent bond. Okay? A non-polar covalent bond would be something that is between, a bond that's between two atoms that have the same electronegativity. Okay? So like if we look at Two hydrogens. That's a great example. What's the electronegativity of hydrogen? 2.1 divide. The other, the hydrogen, 2.1 divide. So the difference in electronegativity here is going to equal zero divide, right? So we say this is a polar covalent bond. Is that what we say? No, no it's actually a non-polar covalent bond. Okay. Non-polar. What you'll find is that polar covalent bonds, because they like to, because the molecules themselves, okay, let me start over. If a molecule has polar covalent bonds in it, the molecules, remember, kind of like to stick to each other, okay? So what you find is that when you've got polar covalent bonds in a molecule or a polar molecule, okay, so overall this molecule is going to be considered polar water here and overall this consider this molecule is going to be considered nonpolar when you have polarity associated with a molecule it increases the boiling point increases the melting point um, because those things like to stick together more and remember uh, boiling point is like when the liquids kind of break away and fly away okay so if one of them's holding on to the other one more Right? It's not going to allow it to break away as easily. Okay? Okay, so let's talk about multiple bonds. Okay, so we've already talked about single bonds. Those are bonds in between two atoms that are just two shared electrons. Just like what we have here, or what we have in the example in methane here. Okay. Let's look at um, a molecule that contains a double bond. Okay. Six. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. 
electron. So how many valence electrons more do each of these oxygens want? Two, Two right? Because they want to have eight. Um, but one of the oxygens isn't going to give up the other its electrons to the other oxygen. But what they can do is share four electrons. Okay? And if we share these two and these two, right, like this, like that, what you'll find is that the new structure will be O. When you have more than one pair of shared electrons in between the same two atoms, you're going to form a multiple bond. Okay, so this is a multiple bond. This one in particular is called a double bond. Okay, and it's the sharing of more than two electrons. Remember, you can only share multiples of two, right? It's actually going to be two, four, or six. So you're not going to have quadruple bond. Oh, okay. Yeah. Again, you want you're really ready to talk about structure. I'm not ready to talk about it. Okay. So we'll just talk about bonding for right now. Structure is a whole different ball game. Okay. So does everybody see how to take this to make this? If we look here, how many lone pair electrons does this oxygen have? Uh, four. four lone pairs, right? So four lone pair electrons, but two lone pairs. Okay, yeah. So it's got four lone pair electrons, but two lone pairs. Okay, yeah. So that was kind of... But anyway, so this has got four lone pair electrons, and how many bonding electrons? Four. Four. It has to have four, right? Why does it have to have four and four? Because it has to have eight. It has to have eight. So does it have two bonding electrons? No, it's got four. Right? Right? Is that right? Or am I am I tripping or what's going on here? <laughs> Everybody's like looking at me like this is I'm a crazy person, right? We just talked about this for like the last twenty minutes, right? So each one of those lines represents how many electrons? Two. Two electrons. So since there's two lines in between those two atoms, how many electrons does that represent? Four. Four. Okay. And remember these little dots here. Those represent each one electron, right? Right. Okay. So if we look at this oxygen atom, how many electrons does it have around it? Eight. 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 It's got to have eight. It's got to have eight, right? Why does it have to have eight? Because it wants to fill its shell, right? Just like we talked about all last week, you know, yeah, on Monday, you know, the week before that, you know, all this stuff. Okay, let's try this again. How many electrons does that oxygen atom have around it? Eight. eight. Why does it have to have eight? Because it wants to fill its shell, right? It wants to fill its shell, okay? Okay, so um, let's try nitrogen. I'll let you try nitrogen on your own. one of the diatomic gases that you're going to have to know, okay? So, if it's a diatomic gas, it only means it's got two nitrogens, right? It's just two nitrogens, okay? So, nitrogen, how many valence electrons does nitrogen atom have? Five. One, two, three, four, five. Now let's talk to talk. It does not matter. You Top, start with whatever you want, okay? You can start with whatever you want. It does not matter. Let's let's start with the bottom at the electron, just so we can say, okay? I start with the top because I'm very tall, and the board is down here usually compared to me. You know what I'm saying? So that's why I start with the top. Maybe somebody who is very small might start with the bottom. You know what I'm saying? But that's just it. Uh, and 
since I'm right-handed, a lot of times I'll start with the right side, you know, but if I'm left-handed, you know, I think, I think my wife goes the other way around. But it doesn't matter. Does not matter. Do not get caught, caught up in these, like, details. You're going to make yourselves go crazy. Okay, it's just dot, 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 dot. Five dots around a um, uh, um, letter. Okay? Let's do the other nice thing, Adam. Wow. We'll start from up here this time. Four, five. Okay, so this guy's got his lone pair on the bottom. This one's got his lone pair on the top. Does not matter. nitrogen molecule, okay, in your own time, if you've already got it, congratulations, uh, what I can tell you is that it'll have a triple bond in between those two nitrogen atoms, okay, you can come and ask me after class if you're concerned about your stuff, okay, at the end of the day, when you make N2, though, how many electrons will each of those nitrogen atoms have around them? Eight. Why will they have eight again? Because they want to fill their shell. Why do they want to fill their shell? To be complete. To be complete. Noble what, what? Noble gas. Very stable, right? Noble gases are very stable. Okay, that's why they want to do it. And in fact, um, in a different sort of type of stability, what you'll find is that when you've got a single bond between atoms, this is very easy to break, those single bonds. Okay? If you got a double bond, it's harder to break that. Okay? It takes more energy. Triple bond, very, very hard to break. Okay? So nitrogen, if you know about the atmosphere, anything about the atmosphere, nitrogen is 78% of the atmosphere. The reason why is because it's very, very stable, because it's got this triple bond. So nothing reacts with it except um, plants, right? Plants have this molecule in them called Rubisco that can take nitrogen and twist it in such a way to break that stable triple bond, okay? So that's the reason why you've got a lot of nitrogen in it for those of you who are Okay, so um, I've already essentially gone over this, so we're going to go over this quite fast. Lewis structure guidelines, so these, these molecules that we've been building today, these are also called Lewis structures, okay? But they're Lewis structures of molecules, not atoms. Wow. You're going to use the molecular formula to write the skeletal structure of the compound. Put the least electronegative atom in the central position. So if we got carbon dioxide, oxygen's more electronegative than carbon, so carbon's going to be in the middle between the two oxygens. So you can draw the skeletal structure. That's just drawing an O, then a line, then a C, then a line, then an O. Because you know they all have to be bonded together. So they have to be sharing at least two electrons. Find the electronegativity here. Put that one in the middle. Okay. Uh, determine the number of valence electrons. Uh, what I want you to do is go through this on your own. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to keep doing this. Okay. Um, polyatomic. Um, here's, some, here's some good representations of the things that we were doing. Notice they uh, show double-sided arrows, which Again, only in this class you'll see, but from now on I want you to write them as single-sided arrows um, if they're only one electron, okay? And there's some more examples if you need help. But there's nitrogen right there, okay? Nitrogen 2, N2. Um, bond energy, we talked about the bond energy. Triple bond is greater in energy than the double bond, yeah. guys and gals. It's greater in energy than the single bond. Please, guys, I still have about a minute. I know we're all ready to get out. Uh, bond length, um, the distance separating the two nuclei. 
when you get when you get stronger and stronger, when you get go from a single to a double to a triple, the bond length decreases. Okay, so single bonds are very long, double bonds are not as long, triple bonds are very close to each other. Um, I'd like you to try. I'd like you to try to draw the Lewis structures of these compounds: one, two, three, and six. Four and five, we're going to wait for next time. We're going to talk about drawing Lewis structures of polyatomic ions in a, uh, next time. And then we'll hit this for 30 next time, too. Okay?